Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Check what I've got out. I gotta say, it's uh, it's pretty sweet in person to have it. Here's a, a full view. As you can see, it says Jordan has no life on it. Mainly because I was dumb and uh, thought if I put my full name, they wouldn't believe me that I own the channel and they wouldn't give me the thing, uh, which was pretty stupid. I should probably have my full name because now people are just gonna come to my house and be like, what the fuck is that? Um, admittedly, I have to say, uh, in person, very tempting to do drugs off this thing. I don't know if I'm gonna do it, but it's tempting. Anyways, in the meantime, I've been uh, no lifing at uh, peak capacity for the last couple of weeks working on this cockroach DB connector, so let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit more. I think the uh, video for this week is realistically gonna be pretty short because I just didn't have a chance to get that much done. Um, I was pretty much building an entire connector from scratch. I mean, not really from scratch. So just as a quick uh, reminder of what I've been up to, I'm building a cockroach DB connector in Trino. The reason that I'm choosing cockroach DB, I know it sounds kind of arbitrary, but there are a couple of important ones. For starters, it implements the Postgres wire protocol. This means that a lot of tools that you can use with Postgres, you can also use with CockroachDB, which is really important. It means that in theory, if someone is very used to using Postgres, which seems to be the craze right now, you know, we've got a go back to SQL, get simple, just use Postgres type of craze going on, that maybe they could transition to something like CockroachDB at least fairly easily. So that's important to me. The reason that I can't use Postgres, which is another reason that I am using CockroachDB, is that CockroachDB allows time travel queries. So in CockroachDB, you can set a configurable garbage collection window, and during that time period, CockroachDB is performing MVCC, or model view control something or other, I can't remember, but the point is you can actually go back in time to see the prior state of the database by performing a snapshot query. This is really, really important for something like I'm trying to build. Because if you're transferring data from a database to a data warehouse, you need to be able to do that and then only after a few seconds go and update your main catalog saying, hey, I transferred the data. In that meantime, you need to be able to perform historic reads of your database, so it's a critical feature of what it is that I'm trying to build here. With that all being said, it meant that I had to build a connector for one of the databases that support it, which as far as I can tell, there are basically four. I think there's CockroachDB, which is an open source one, so that was nice and it implements the Postgres wire protocol. There was Yugabyte DB, which is another one that I could have done, though frankly I just like the syntax of performing time travel reads in Cockroach a little bit better, so that's why I went with it. Um, there is TIDB, which is implementing the MySQL wire protocol, so I may try and do something there at some point as well. And then there's also Google Spanner, which I didn't think was the best choice because even though I think Spanner is a really cool system, it is closed source at the end of the day. It is something that you can only run in Google Cloud. And frankly, my cheap Jewish ass didn't want to pay for any of that. So my point is I want to embrace open source stuff here. It doesn't really make sense to use Spanner, especially because you know if you're trying to attract potential users, a lot of them are just going to be on AWS or on-prem or whatever and you just can't use Spanner. So it didn't really make sense to me to do that. So that's where we are where we are. Um, the nice part about Cockroach using the Postgres wire protocol was that it meant that it did not take a lot of effort for me to build this connector. If I had to build a database connector from scratch, I would assuredly be acid it and it would take me a while. However, I could basically adapt the Postgres one very, very minimally in order to get everything working. And that's more or less what I did. So if I just come here quickly, um, you know, you can look on the right side of the screen. Basically, these are all the files that I had to amend. So what, uh, what have I done? Changed like 32 things in uh, this commit. But the point is, I actually made fairly minimal changes to some of the files in Postgres so that I could override them a little bit more easily. And then I made minimal changes uh, over here in one class called the CockroachDB Query Builder, which is basically just saying, hey, if I've defined uh, some sort of read version on the Trino table using the as of syntax, I'm just gonna wire that into CockroachDB using CockroachDB syntax, which is using as of system time. And that's actually worked fairly nicely. I showed off last week that we can do things successfully there. And the biggest thing that happened basically between last week and now is that if I actually go to the Postgres test, so right now I'm basically in the CockroachDB tests. If I come over here, you know, I'm actually extending the Postgres tests and there are like 300 of those because Postgres is itself extending the JDBC base connector tests and that's extending the base Trino connector tests. So there are literally hundreds of tests that I wanted to get passing here. And ultimately I was able to do that this week by going through kind of all the edge cases of the ones that were failing and fixing them up. A little bit of a pain in the ass. A lot of it revolved around the fact that CockroachDB just like doesn't seem to have an integer type or like the type that it calls integer is actually eight bytes instead of four bytes. 
pain in the ass. Uh, at some point, I'm going to put this up for review, and uh, I guess it's no uh, worth noting that the actual pace of reviews and like getting work done in the open source community, especially for me when I'm not actually like you know this isn't my job, right? So I'm looking at this for like an hour every single day. The uh, the pace at which I can make open source commits here is very slow. So I'm coming to realize that you know as this project goes on a little bit more, I probably shouldn't be reliant too much on other people reviewing my code and me actually submitting that because I can just tell you in practice it's very unlikely. The Kafka change has gotten little to no attention. The hoodie change, actually I do have one person who seems like they're gonna wanna merge it soon. Um, but you know, for such a small change, we have just had so much back and forth on it, it's really something. And uh, you know, that's not to discredit the person reviewing it. All the comments that they made have been very valid. It's just like, you know, the, the feedback cycle between me and this guy who literally lives in Japan, it's like two days between changes. So, you know, it just goes to show you how shitty that can be. Anyways, uh, nonetheless, I'll continue because I don't really have too much to show off uh, code-wise this week. The one thing that I did want to show off is actually this guy right here. Um, doo -doo -doo. So everything that is a connector in Trino um, you know, implements this one class called connector metadata that's helping to get information about the external system that you're connecting to. So one method that's on the connector metadata that's actually become really important for me recently as I continue to plan out this project is this one right here. It's called apply table scan redirect. And actually this other one right here, redirect table, I have to figure out the exact difference between the two of them. But I think the main point here uh, that is really important to me is that it means that you can take in a result into your connector and you can actually redirect that to another connector or another view or another table, which is really, really critical for what it is that I'm trying to do. So as I continue to plan out this feature, let me just go off and show what I'm trying to do quickly on an Excalibur for the final flow. Because now I think now that I actually have a little bit more experience in Trino, I can actually speak to what I expect the final flow here to look like. Whereas when I was first starting this project out, I didn't really know how Trino worked. I didn't really have a sense of how the connectors work. And I couldn't really you know, give you guys a detailed diagram of that. So doing a little bit more research, I think this is basically what we're uh, kind of converging on. A user is going to submit a query, right? And they're going to submit it to, you know, Jordan's connector, right? So they have some sort of connector uh, that they've set up in their Trino instance. And basically what this means is that has some sort of catalog of tables. That catalog of tables is probably coming from this guy over here, which is like my data harness or whatever. So I'm basically advertising, hey, you've got table Jordan, right? So they query for table Jordan, select star from table Jordan. And what that does is it hits my connector Jordan's connector then says, all right, let me go figure out the sources that actually make up Table Jordan. Because remember, Table Jordan is really just a hybrid or a union of multiple different disparate sources. It could be Kafka, it could be a transactional database, it could be an analytical database. And when we query this database, it's going to return what our data sources are. So that's step one. Maybe we figure out, oh, hey, this table consists of a couple of partitions in Kafka, a little bit of information in CockroachDB in one particular table, and then also some information from an iceberg table, which is where we kind of archive our historic data. So what Jordan's connector is now going to do is it's going to create a Trino view. Now a Trino view is basically just an arbitrary SQL statement that is abstracted behind one table. So we create this view where we're basically saying, all right, now Trino you know, understands there's this other table called Jordan's table, where Jordan's table is basically the union between Kafka partition one between a couple sets of offsets, uh, Kafka partition two between a different set of offsets, CockroachDB as of some certain system time, and also some iceberg table, you know, whatever the name of it is, as of some other time. The reason for this is that now all of a sudden we're performing snapshot reads on multiple different data sources that support them. And so now we've got multiple different data sets that support repeatable reads while also having different data properties, right? Storing data in Kafka and querying it has many different advantages and disadvantages versus doing the same thing in CockroachDB versus doing the same thing in Iceberg. We want to take advantage as the user of these different properties between tables in order to get exactly one semantics when inserting data, in order to get um, atomicity when moving data between one data source to the other, and also to have a consistent view of this data between Trino and Spark and other sort of uh, query engines. So basically, it's a very simple system. I create this view, right? So now all of a sudden I can query this table, Jordan's table, from any connector in Trino. And then I just redirect my query to Jordan's table, get the results right back, and return them back to the user. So actually, it's seeming like what it is that I'm trying to do is not terribly hard in Trino. I'm sure that it's going to be the case that I'm actually wrong, and this is going to be a lot harder than I anticipated. But at least high level, it doesn't seem so bad for now. 
I think the interesting thing with building a data harness like this is that, you know, when I build that and then I try and explain to people in the actual like open source Trino community, like, hey, I want to open source this, I think I'm going to get very little buy in there because this is not an existing system. When I go ahead and do this, that's the part where I actually have to start evangelizing this bullshit, you know, becoming my little Sam Bankman Freed like tech entrepreneur thing where I go on Hacker News and LinkedIn and whatever and try and explain that this is a good technology so that people actually let me open source this as a first class citizen of Trino. I can then try and do the same exact thing in Spark. I'm sure it would be a very similar approach. And ultimately, that's pretty much going to have to be what it is because in order to make something an open source technology, you kind of have to get buy-in from the people that have already been working on that thing. Now, the nice thing with Trino and with Spark is that at the end of the day, I can always you know, create some Java artifacts or some jars and other people can download them. But to really achieve you know, maximum popularity, in my opinion, I probably have to get this thing merged into the upstream project. That's the only way that you know, it's going to evolve as the project does and people don't have to like constantly fork their systems to use my tool and you know, it blocks their upgrades because uh, you know, my thing isn't compatible with the newest version of Trino or Spark. So yeah, hopefully that gives you guys a little bit more of a roadmap on a long-term vision. Um, I appreciate everyone that's watching this. I hope it's still, uh, you know, a little bit interesting. It's been very interesting for me, so I'm having a very cool time with it. And as always, I will see you in the next one. Can't wait.